We are truly honored by the presence of visitors. We are glad that you're here this morning and hope that you will stay after our worship service when we uh, go into our Bible classes and then after that so we can get to know you a little bit better. We want to remember tonight that our 6 o'clock service will be moved to 7.30, that we will not be meeting at 6 o'clock as normal, but we will be meeting at 7.30, so that will go along with <clears throat> the gospel meeting that... <clears throat> that actually starts tonight. So we do have that beginning tonight. Um, it's going to go through April 22nd through the 25th, 7.30 every night, Sunday night through Wednesday night. We still have a few invitations next to the door, so if you know of someone who may be interested, pick up one of those invitations and uh, please give it to them so that we can help spread the gospel throughout this community. The book of Romans is a fascinating book. When you look at the book of Romans, you see how that Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, explains how that sinful man can be made right in the sight of God. <clears throat> how that sinful man, who has cut himself off from God by his own sins, can be justified <clears throat> or be saved in God's sight. When you come to Romans chapter 8, and what we're going to do this morning is look at the entire chapter, you find some fascinating things. What we're going to find in uh, Romans chapter 8 is we're going to see that all three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, <clears throat> and God the Holy Spirit, are all involved in our salvation. That God in His totality is interested in my salvation and in your salvation. As Paul concludes Romans chapter 7 and declares himself to be sinful and the only one to deliver him is the Lord Jesus Christ, he says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Verses 1 through 8 of Romans chapter 8, we see freedom from sin. Romans 8, 1 through 8, freedom from sin. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk or live their life according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We've been set free because of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to make our freedom uh, available to us, when we believe and we obey and we walk according to His will, walk in the Spirit, then we are not condemned. The sins that we are guilty of, we are forgiven. Look at verse 2 of Romans chapter 8. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus refers to the Gospel. The Gospel message which Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, is God's power to save. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. The word gospel means good news, good message. And that is good news. That law, the law of the gospel that is from the Spirit, that is in Christ Jesus, sets us free or releases us from the guilt of our sin and from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is simply this. If you sin, you're caught off from God. You're caught, caught off from Him, cut off from Him, and you die spiritually. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. We were born into this world innocent. We reach a certain level of maturity in which we know right from wrong. We choose to do wrong. We sin we die spiritually because Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 makes it very clear that our sins separate us from God. However, the gospel, the good news, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, can set us free. And once we have been set free from sin, once we have been released from our sins, we have been set free from that bondage that is in sin, we now have a responsibility to live according to the spirit. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, 
He condemned sin in the flesh. The law there, referring to the law of Moses in context of Romans, could not do because of the weakness of the flesh. There was no weakness in the law of Moses. The problem was with human beings, not with God's law. But people violated the will of God, they broke the covenant, and that made that covenant weak on the human part. Not on God's part, but on the human part. God did what the law could not accomplish by sending His Son. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1 and verse 14. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin to condemn sin in the flesh. Jesus had to take on flesh in order to die. He could not die as deity. And he could not represent uh, God if he were simply just a man. He was both God and man. And he condemned sin in the flesh by his death on the cross. Look at verse 4. That the righteous requirement of law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. In other words, we conduct our life according to the will of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Notice it begins in the mind. Sin begins in the mind, and so does obedience. It begins in the heart. It begins in our ability to choose. And he is saying here that those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh. They want to do what they want to do. If it feels good, they're going to do it. If it feels bad, even though it might be good for them, they're not going to do it. They're going to live according to how they feel. And he says that is something that brings about death. Verse 6, spiritual separation from God. But the spiritually minded person is the person who sets his mind on the things of the Spirit. That brings about life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God. The person who is worldly is at odds with God. The worldly Christian is an unfaithful Christian. And that person is at enmity or at odds with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. The person who wants to live how they want to live, they cannot subject themselves to the will of God because they don't want to. They don't want any restraint on their life. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do or how to live. Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who live according to their own dictates, those who live according to their own will, they have their own standard of right and wrong, they live according to the flesh, they cannot please God in that mindset. However, Christians have life in the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 17, life in the Holy Spirit. 8, chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. As a Christian, he says in verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Oh, we're in our physical bodies, yes. But our mind is not set on the flesh. It's set on the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If we do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, we don't belong to God. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now notice verse 11 there. <clears throat> there have been various interpretations of this, at least two. It refers to the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus, of course, was resurrected from the dead. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. That proved that He was the Son of God. He was resurrected from the dead, literally, physically, from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And Paul might be saying here, that same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead will resurrect our bodies from the dead at the end of time when Jesus returns. 
Or, verse 11, may be referring to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. We too, when we rise from the watery grave of baptism, we now have life in Jesus Christ. Both statements are true. And we now live in the Spirit. We now have life in the Holy Spirit as a result of the gospel message. And He will give life to our mortal bodies. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to, live, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Notice verse 12. We are debtors. We are obligated to God. We are indebted to God not to live the way we want to live, but to live according to God's will. We owe it to God. That's why he will say later on in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is your reasonable service for you to live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. We are debtors to God. We are obligated to God. Seeing what God has done for us and sending His Son in the flesh to die for us, to die for me, I have an obligation to God to live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body. You will live. Verse 13. He's referring here to living according to the flesh. If you do that, you will die. That's referring to spiritual death. But as we have seen this past week, it also refers to physical death. How many people have died within a week's period of time because they're living in the flesh? They're mad about something. They're upset about something. And they let their rage and their anger turn into murder murder of others, and murder of themselves. That's living in the flesh. And if you do that, you'll die spiritually most certainly, but even physically you could die if you live in the flesh. But if we live according to the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. In other words, you deny yourself and say, I have a desire to do something that I know is contrary to the will of God. However, I am not because I love God and I want to please Him. We're putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. That's spiritual life. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. Paul refers to the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. How that if we live according to the works of the flesh, we're not going to go to heaven. But if we produce the fruit of the Spirit, we will be pleasing to God. We will be led by the Spirit in doing so. Verse 14 in Romans chapter 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. They're the children of God. Not just sons in the male sense, but children of God. We're led, we're guided by the Spirit of God. We are the children of God. We'll have more to say about that in just a moment. Look at verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba were some of the first words that those little babies would say. And Father is a more mature word that is said to describe the relationship to God. And in verse 16 he says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, verse 17, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. Now verse 14 says that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And if we're led by the Spirit of God, we're God's children, we cry out to God, we pray to Him, we call Him Father. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God, and as children, we're heirs, heirs with Christ. Christ is in heaven. Our inheritance is in heaven. If we continue to be led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How are we led by the Spirit of God? Look at Psalm 143, verses 9 through 11. The Bible interprets itself. The Bible interprets itself. How does God lead us? 
Psalm 143, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> the psalmist says, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness, righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Living morally upright. Psalm 5 and verse 8. Psalm 5 and verse 8. <clears throat> Again, the psalmist says, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. God leads us in the land of uprightness, and we are led by the Lord in His righteousness. Psalm 25 and verse 5. <clears throat> Psalm 25 and verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Those who are led by the Spirit, they're the children of God. And the psalmist tells us that we're led by the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said God's word is truth. Psalm 43, 3. Psalm 43, 3. <clears throat> God's Word gives us light. It illuminates our mind. The psalmist said, Oh, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. God's Word, God's truth, illuminates our minds, gives us light. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119 and verse 30. Psalm 119 and verse 30. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. When you compile all the evidence from Genesis to Revelation, you find that when a person believes, trusts, and obeys the written word of God, that person is being led by the Holy Spirit of God. It's that simple. That's how we're led. This is the word of God given by the Holy Spirit of God. When we put place our faith and our trust and our confidence in it, do what it says, we become the children of God, and we are being led by the Spirit of God. Back to Romans chapter 8. Verses 18 through 30. We have hope in suffering. Hope in suffering. Remember what he said <clears throat> as he talked about Christ. If we suffer with him, we may be glorified together with him. We have suffering in this world. Romans 8 verses 18 through 30. Paul says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We're suffering in this world to a certain extent. All of us are. And he says the suffering that we experience in this world is not worthy to be compared to the glories of heaven that will be someday revealed. It says, verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What in the world is he talking about here? Well, you remember in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, God placed a curse on this planet. When man sinned, when woman sinned, they introduced evil onto this world when they gave in to temptation. Remember what God said to Adam, Cursed be the ground 
for your sake. Because of the sin that you committed. That wasn't just referring to the ground that he was standing on. That referred to the whole earth. The earth was placed under a curse because of Adam and Eve's sin. And we inherit that curse. We don't inherit sin. But we are born into a world that's cursed. That's flawed. That has problems. And one day the creation will be liberated from that. When Jesus returns. One day the children of God will be delivered from that curse. In heaven there will be no more curse. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3. There will be no curse in heaven. That's why it says in heaven there will be no more crying. There will be no more death. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more suffering. No more curse. And so the creation is waiting for that to happen. Waiting for that day that Christ returns and the faithful children of God are resurrected, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that this body will be transformed into something immortal and free from the curse that's on this earth. Look at verse 22, Romans chapter 8. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also have who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoptions, the adoption, the redemption of our body. Remember in verse 1, we've already been set free from sin. We're, we're saved if we're a faithful Christian right now. We have been born again. But at the end of time, in the resurrection, there's going to be the redemption of our bodies. Our spirit will be reunited with a resurrected body. That body will be immortal, free from disease, free from the curse, free from death, to exist in heaven for eternity. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, verse 23 says. That means we have the best that the Holy Spirit has to offer. We have the very best. The first fruits were the first of the crops offered to God under the Old Testament. We have the very best that the Holy Spirit has to offer. Verse 24, For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? In other words, we, we haven't achieved it yet. We're not at the end of time yet. We're not at the end of time until Jesus returns. And so we're still hoping for this anticipation, this resurrection, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 25, but if we hope for what uh, we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. In other words, we remain steadfast. We remain faithful because we know that it's something that God promised and God will never go back on His promises. In the midst of this suffering, we also have assistance from the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we are to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You know, sometimes in the midst of this cursed planet that we live in, we're so full of sorrow, we don't know how to pray as we ought. We just don't know what to say. But the Spirit of God who dwells in us knows us inside and out better than we know ourselves, And He makes intercession to the Father in our behalf. Now, I may not understand all of that, and I really don't need to. I just accept it by faith. This is not something that the Holy Spirit is doing to me. It's something that the Holy Spirit is doing for me before the Father. The Holy Spirit is making intercession for me when I suffer and sometimes just don't know how to word my prayers, don't know how to put them together because I'm full of sorrow. He makes intercession. To intercede means to make a petition on behalf of another. So we not only have God the Father sending His Son, but we also have the Holy Spirit leading us through the truth and the Holy Spirit making intercession for us according to the will of God. All of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved in our salvation. Look at verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose. We've been called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That spirit of life, that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We've been called by that gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now notice what it says. We know that all things work together. It does not say all good things. You know for the faithful Christian, even bad things work together for good. Ultimately. Tragedy, terrible things, disappointment, heartache. All of those things for the faithful Christian works together for our good. So not only the good things work together for our good, but even the bad things can work together for our good. <clears throat> for those who have been called according to his purposes. We have been called by God through the gospel. In verse 29 and 30 of Romans chapter 8, you see the whole scope of redemption from beginning to end. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be, a, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So notice here, he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image. He foreknew this plan. You read Ephesians, you find that the church, the body of Christ, was in the mind of God before he even created the world. And for someone like me, to be a part of God's eternal purpose is astonishing. That I can be called by the Creator who loved me so much not only to give me life, but to give me spiritual life, to redeem me from my own sins. He predestined me, that means He predetermined that I should conform my life to the image of His Son. In other words, I am to try to be like Jesus to the best of my ability. That's the whole purpose of being a Christian. To be like Christ. Verse 30. Moreover whom he predestined he also called. Called by the gospel. We've obeyed that gospel. We've become Christians. Those he called he justified. That's salvation. We've been pronounced not guilty. Even though we have sinned. And whom he have justified these he also glorified. That's the ultimate goal of salvation. In heaven. Glorification. We have hope in suffering. Verses 31 through 39 of Romans chapter 8. We have hope in persecution. Verses 31 through 39 of Romans 8. We have hope in persecution. You know, if we live a faithful Christian life, we're going to be persecuted. It's going to happen to one degree or another. And he says in verse 30, 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, taking everything that we've looked at from verse 1 all the way through, when he says God, he's referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If God is on our side, who can really be against us? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 speaks of persecution. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We might have the whole world against us, yet God is for us. Verse 32. God did not even spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God did not even spare his own son, but was willing to give his son to suffer, to be mistreated, to be spit upon, to be crucified for me, what's he going to hold back from me? That which I need, not necessarily what I might want, but what I need. The answer is nothing. Everything that I need, God is going to provide. Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect, God's children? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So here we're told that God the Son, Jesus Christ, makes intercession for us. He's our mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. Our go-between. So we have the Holy Spirit making intercession for us. And we have our mediator, Jesus Christ, making intercession for us. Verse 25, or excuse me, 35 through 39, he says, Who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
as it is written, quoting Psalm 44, 22, For your sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It starts off by talking about the salvation that is in Christ, and he ends by talking about the salvation, the love, that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from that. Nothing can. So even though we suffer persecution for the cause of Christ, we have hope in persecution. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 is a summation. As I said earlier, all three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are involved in our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. <clears throat> Peter writes to Christians, and he calls them the elect according to the foreknowledge of the Father, God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There is no excuse for a child of God to be lost. None whatsoever. I mean, if God was not willing to withhold His own Son to, to provide us salvation, then how can we say that there's anything that we're lacking? And if you're not a faithful child of God, we urge you to, to repent and come back to the Lord this very morning. Confess your sins. We will pray for you and with you. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to obey this gospel, this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Confess your faith. Repent of all your sins and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And God will forgive you. He will cleanse you. And from that point on, as a child of God, you can be led by the Holy Spirit of God. We urge you to obey the gospel. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and we sing. <clears throat>